Hi, everyone. My name is Robert Kagan, and I'm a senior associate with Nonprofit Finance Fund based in our Boston office. This webinar, as part of our larger webinar series, is part one of financial planning, where we'll focus on the business model, understanding our financial history, and how we connect that to our future. Before we begin the content for today, it's become our practice to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we stand and the history that has allowed us to be on this land. I'm coming today from traditional Massachusetts land. If you haven't before, we encourage you to look up the Native communities that traditionally have inhabited your land, as well as those who are still there today. In case you haven't worked with us before, Nonprofit Finance Fund is a national organization that works across the country to help support nonprofits, and particularly in recent years to support nonprofits serving people of color that are led by people of color. We do this in a variety of different ways. We started as a community development financial institution and still to this day work with nonprofits to provide them loans for various types of projects and access to capital. Where I sit is within our advisory services department, where we work as a trusted partner and financial educator to help organizations combine their, their financial knowledge and their impact um, to create outcomes. We also work to advocate on behalf of the nonprofit sector as a whole in order to create a more equitable system in nonprofit finance. Before we get, get into the specific content for today, we want to just be able to show the faces of those who are giving these webinars, um, knowing that this is not always the best way to connect, at least hopefully seeing our faces will allow you to understand who we are a little bit um, and understand what we're doing here. So what are we talking about today? There's three different learning goals that are included as part of this webinar. The first is to learn how to read and interpret income and loss statements. Um, this is really trying to understand what your financial history is. We're then going to try and connect those dynamics that we see in our income and expense history to how we think about our financial future. We'll also learn some key budgeting terms, thinking specifically about restrictions um, and operating versus non-operating revenue and expense. The way we think about nonprofit finance as a whole really can be boiled down to this picture that we have here. There's two main parts to nonprofit finance. The first one is our business model. This is how we make and spend money in service of our mission. Ultimately, the underlying question is, are we able to, uh, to cover our costs? On the other side, we have the balance sheet. This is having to do with what we own, what we owe, and the net difference between the two or our net worth. Ultimately, we want to try and understand, do we have enough access to cash in order to think about both our short-term and our long-term needs? When we connect the two, what we really want to see is a business model that's consistently generating surpluses. What this allows us to do is put away money for our current needs and our future needs, above and beyond what our short-term immediate needs are. Sometimes our balance sheet also might be able to grow as a result of a one-time investment, knowing that it's really hard to consistently put away enough surplus in order to really be able to fit all of our needs. When we have that healthy balance sheet, that, that cash that we need, it sometimes allows us to reinvest in our business model to make sure that our programs are both able to serve the needs of the community, as well as financially to continue to generate those surpluses as the world around us changes. In an ideal world, we keep going around this circle, but we know that this is really, really hard and, and really more of the exception than the rule when it comes to the way that nonprofits work. And so a lot of what we'll talk about today, starting with the business model, is thinking about how to make this possible and how to work towards this as a goal. So we'll start by looking at the income statement or profit and loss statement. There are three parts of this historical document, which either can be part of internal documentation or part of an audit. Um, we think about the revenue, that's the money coming into the organization, our expenses, which is the money that goes out of our organization, and our surplus or our deficit, meaning do we have more revenue coming in than expense or more expense coming in than revenue? 
when we think about revenue, we want to think about the different types of revenue that we have coming in. So we have our earned revenue, the dollars that we are directly paid for our services, and our contributed revenue, which are dollars that come in from donors of various types. When we're thinking about revenue, we have three main questions that we're trying to understand. Um, we want to know where did the money actually come from? We want to know, is that money reliable or do we think it might be at risk of not being able to keep, keep coming back? And we also want to understand how seasonality might, might matter. Are there certain times of years that we're able to bring in more revenue than other times of years? On the expense side, we want to think about what our big categories are of our expenses and really understand where's the money going? How are we spending the money? Are those ways predictable or do we have sudden expenses coming in that we're not able to expect? And in those difficult times in which we need to cut expenses, do we know where that might happen? Are we able to make the changes with forethought? Um, and are we able to make those changes without it being an emergency? Finally, again, we look at this idea of surplus or deficit, profitability and savings. And we really want to understand at a very base level, are we able to cover our costs? And as I spoke about during the last slide, are we able to achieve a surplus so that we can build towards our long-term needs? So in an ideal world, there's a few things that we'll want to see. As I mentioned again, and, and it's important to keep mentioning, we really do want to see a surplus where possible. We want to make sure also that it's not just our finances that we're thinking about in terms of our business model, but that we're really able to have programs that reflect the needs of the community and that we have some way of knowing that we're actually having outcomes. We want to know that we have the staff that we need um, and particularly that staff are paid and supported, paid well and supported in their jobs. Even if we're able to have a surplus, but it's only as a result of staff putting in time well above what they're really paid to, to do, that's not a business model that we consider sort of healthy because it doesn't actually cover the costs of being able to do the work. We also want to make sure that we're not feeling tired and panicked constantly, that we know where the dollars are coming from. And even if some of it is at risk, that we have a general sense of how to pursue the dollars that we need. So these are four of many different places that, that nonprofits get dollars coming in. I want to spend a little time talking about the dynamics of each of these these types of revenue, um, and also think about how we're connecting, again, our history of where, the where we know we've been able to get dollars coming in in the past to what we can expect for the future. So for earned income, this is, like I said before, those dollars that we are directly paid for work that we're doing. Sometimes the earned income could come directly from those who are serving. Um, more often than not, they're also somehow contributed through other sources, sometimes governments, sometimes foundations, but directly paid for a specific service that we're doing. We also see individual contributions. These are those dollars coming in from average people who want to keep, keep your work. When we think about individual donors, we think about how it takes a lot of work to be able to really maintain those connections, to make those asks, to steward those relationships, um, and the specific skill sets that it takes in order to have a robust individual giving campaign um, and, and regular revenue coming in from these sources. What's nice about the individual dollars, though, is that they tend to come in like earned income without any restrictions, meaning that once we have the dollars, we can do whatever we need to do with those dollars in order to serve our organization's needs as well as our community's needs. On the other hand, foundation and government dollars tend to come in with some sort of restrictions, meaning that while the dollar amounts tend to be a little bit larger, we need to use them for a very specific purpose. Oftentimes, these sources don't cover necessarily the full cost of being able to implement a program, but just the direct costs associated with that program. We've worked with foundations and governments to try and cover more of what we sometimes call overhead, um, but we know that it can be a challenge to get, get both foundations and governments to work on programs that are not new and exciting, even if we know that they work really well. 
So as, as I was talking about, and there's many more than, than I already talked about, each type of revenue has its own sort of strengths, the risks um, and associated costs that come with trying to bring in that type of revenue. So as we're thinking about the future, we want to start by trying to understand how is the mix that we currently have from these sources and others, how well is it working? Are we able to really predict what our future revenue is going to be based on the relationships we've had and based on the work that we've put in? The other thing is that as we're thinking about change in these places, we want to make sure that we're aware of associated costs. Um, we want to know that we're working sort of within our skill set and that we're able to know where to go to bring in these additional dollars. If we've never worked with individuals, for example, before, we should be thinking about the way that that is a totally different skill set than trying to get foundation or government dollars. So I want to take just a moment here for everyone to reflect and think about what their, their current sources of revenue are. Um, specifically thinking about what is sort of the largest one and, and thinking about what are really the strengths, what is really great about the sources of revenue that you currently have, and what about your current mix of where the dollars are coming from are a challenge that you'd like to work on. So we have certain categories that we like to think of in terms of our expenses as well. The biggest one tends to be our personnel. People tend to be both the most expensive thing that we do as nonprofits, um, but also the most important thing. You know, we like to say that, that most nonprofits are not creating widgets. They're, they're working with people and serving people in various ways, and, and our people are, are there to support that. Professional fees cover any sort of professional that we're bringing into the organization to do a specific task. So, so oftentimes this includes um, an accountant or an auditor. Sometimes this includes a lawyer. Anything that's going to those places would fall under these professional fees. Occupancy is exactly what it sounds like. It's where our physical space is. So this can include rent. It can include mortgage if you're, you're an owner of a property. And then finally, we, we bucket the rest of our costs into support, not to say that they're less important, but that they're, they're less sort of specific and think about all of the other ways that, that money is, is going out of our organizations. What's really important here is that we wanna understand what are the financial levers that managers of organizations can pull should they need to change their expenses, either to grow or, or to shrink and really understand what the effects of those changes might be. Again, though, it's really important that as we're thinking about our changes in revenue and our changes in expense, that we understand the interconnection between the two, that it costs money to be able to bring money into the organization. And so if we are to look to expand our revenue from, let's say, individual donors, it's likely going to take someone's time and therefore cost the organization money in order to bring in those additional dollars. And similarly, if we make cuts to parts of the organization, that might also have an, an effect on the revenue that the organization is able to bring in. And so when we're thinking about the future, it's always really, really important to to move in a direction that works in both the changes to the revenue and the expense when we're thinking about our ultimate surplus or deficit. So we're gonna take this concept and we're gonna complicate it a little bit further in the way that it often is in nonprofits by thinking a little bit about restrictions. And so we use this water metaphor to think about how we're able to pay for expenses, thinking about those resources and the types of restrictions they have. So the goal at the bottom here is that we want to be able to use our expenses to water our carrots down at the bottom. We're only able to use resources to cover our expenses if those resources are without restrictions. Organizations are able to bring in resources without restrictions, dollars without restrictions, primarily in two ways. One is through earned revenue. So again, that's when we're directly paid for services. After we've, we've done those services and we've paid for them, generally those dollars are without restrictions and can be used to cover our expenses. Similarly, contributed dollars 
often times come in without restriction. So again, these are the when we have donors giving giving dollars to our organization as a whole as general operating support that we can use to cover any of the expenses that we'd like. Oftentimes, nonprofits also have revenue coming in that have various types of restrictions. And there's two main types of restrictions that we think of. There's those that are restricted based on timing. So you're only able to use these dollars after a certain amount of time or that the dollars need to be split between one year and another year. And we have revenue that comes in with purpose-bound restrictions, meaning we are only able to spend the dollars in a certain way for a certain purpose, like a specific program. When those dollars come in, they sit in a separate bucket up at the top uh, where we think of dollars that have restrictions, dollars with restrictions. Technically, we're not actually able to use those dollars to cover our expenses until they're released from restrictions and come into our net assets without restrictions. I'm gonna put up on the screen here the technical definition because this is a, an accounting term, and I think it's helpful to have that definition in the background, but really we wanna focus more so on the overall concept here, which is that again, those assets are released from restriction either based on time, meaning when we're allowed to use them in the year or in the month that it's signed in the contract saying that we're allowed to use those dollars, or the moment that we use them for their purpose. So if, for example, dollars are only allowed to pay a certain salary for a certain position, when we pay that salary, technically that is the moment that the assets are released from restrictions and then used to cover our expenses. So we're gonna look at our first actual statement and we could use this similar sort of format either for a historical financial statement or when we're thinking into the future. Um, and the key point here is that we want to make sure that we are separating out those dollars that are coming in without restrictions from those dollars that are coming in with restrictions. So you'll notice at the bottom here that we have multiple bottom lines. We have the bottom line without restriction, the bottom line with restrictions, and then the total. What's important to note is that when dollars come in with restrictions, those dollars can then be converted to dollars without restrictions through this line called net assets released from restrictions. And so you'll notice in this example here, there's about $110,000 coming in, in revenue from foundation grants with restrictions. Of that $110,000 that came in during that year, only about $10,000 were released from restrictions to be allowed to be used within that year. So we're going to use another moment for reflection to try and answer this question and to think of the various surplus and deficit lines at the bottom, which of those columns are going to tell us whether our business model is working or not, whether we're able to, to generate a sufficient surplus. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and then we'll go over the answer. So when we at NFF think about is a business model at an organization working, we really just think about this without restrictions line. And the reason for that is that those are the dollars that were actually able to be used within that year. So the dollars that come in with restrictions that might be intended for a future year or that we weren't able to use for their purpose yet, they're important because they'll, they'll add to our overall assets that we have access to, but we're not technically allowed to use them. And so we really just want to focus on this first line, this without restrictions column, in order to tell us again, is our business model working? And, and this specific example here is a really good example of why that's so important. If we look at the dollars all mixed in together, it looks like there's a surplus for the year. There's 60,000 more dollars coming into the organization overall than we're actually spent for that year. That being said, because only 10,000 of the 110,000 that dollars that came in with restrictions were able to be used in that year, in terms of dollars that were actually intended for that year, there's really a $40,000 deficit. 
And so I know this is, can be a little bit of a confusing topic that takes a moment to really take in and, and to understand why, but it's really important that we're able to track our restrictions in this way so that we can understand, again, when are we actually using the dollars and when are we allowed to use those dollars and what does that mean for our overall bottom line for the year? So I'm going to pause it here just for another second to, to look through these numbers and to think through that before we move into another topic. So we're going to complicate this just one more time by separating out not only restricted and unrestricted dollars, but also thinking about what is non-operating versus operating revenue and what is operating versus non-operating expense. And what we mean by operating is anything that is reliable and repeatable that we expect to occur every year. So when we're thinking about our sort of initial bottom line, we only want to include, again, our sort of regular, repeatable business model. The reason that we do that is that non-operating or sort of these irregular one-time or occasional revenue and expense items might distort the picture of how we generally are, are doing with what we're able to expect. So for example, if there's a year in which we have a capital campaign, and that's not something that we do every year, it might look a little bit weird if suddenly we have a huge, huge surplus in one year and that we have a big spike in the size of that, the, our revenue for that year, and then suddenly it goes down the next year. We want to be able to smooth that out in a way that really makes sense for, again, what we could expect to happen every year and not to sort of obscure and change the way that our regular business model works. And so... Here's some examples here of, again, how we separate out this idea of operating versus non-operating revenue and expense. So our operating is, again, our earned and contributed revenue, our net assets released from, restric from restrictions. And then we separate out these sort of one-time things. So another really good example is a bequest. We can't really expect that we're going to continue to get big requests every single year if this is something that only happens in this one year. So rather than having that big spike, we're going to put that non-operating, non-regular revenue below the line in a separate section so that we can see what our normal expected revenue and expense are going to be above the line. And then below the line, anything that happened in that year that was different, that might change our overall net assets. So there's a couple other examples here, things like investments that we don't have control over, um, pass-through that can really change the size of our organization that it looks like on paper that doesn't necessarily have as much work associated with it, um, and, and again, any sort of capital campaign. On the expense side, we have, again, all of our regular repeatable expenses up top. And then on the bottom, anything that, that is out of the ordinary, so capital expenditures, for example. So if we were to purchase or make reservation re renovations on a building, we don't want to include that and make it look like there was a large deficit that year just because we're making those changes, but rather put them below the line so that we could still see that they're changing our net assets, changing the savings that we have, but without changing what the budget looks like for that year. And so I'll show another example here, again, where we look at an organization's budget, our revenue and our expense without restrictions, and then those with restrictions. We have our initial bottom line showing just our operating support and expense. And then below the line, we have these sort of one-time things in an odd year. So one, another example of that might be PPP loans are not something that we could expect every year, or local, local COVID response funding is not something that we expect every year. And so we look below the line to where those would come in as revenue. And there might be some related one-time equipment purchases that we're not expecting to make in the future. And so we don't want this to distort what we're expecting things to look like in the future. And so we put that all below the line. And so this is another good example where it looks like there's a deficit for the year. And really for, if this was a typical year, there would be a deficit based on just our regularly budgeted revenue and expense items. 
but because of the extraordinary support that happened this year to cover that deficit, below the line, we see our overall change in net assets as being a surplus. So again, at the top here, is our regular business model working? Are those expected sort of sources of revenue and expense covering themselves? Or do we think in future years we might need to make a change? And then how did the extraordinary items change our overall financial position at the bottom? We want to start in the future because these sort of one-time costs and, and revenue might be a little bit harder to predict. We want to start really just with this above the line and to use the history that we've seen above the line to think about how we can expect our revenue and expense to change in the future. And then add in those other pieces at the bottom, knowing that overall the goal will be that our business model, our operating surplus and expense should be working to our advantage to be able to generate those surpluses. So we're going to close with an example. Um, this is how we visualize a lot of business models. And we want to really understand, again, like we spoke about before, in the past, what has our source of revenue been? And how have our expenses changed? And we want to be able to use this history that we see to be able to help us make predictions about the future. So this, this organization, for example, um, their earned revenue has been growing in recent years. As maybe they brought on more staff, as you can see, the expenses are also growing. They've been able to provide more services that they're directly paid for. We also see that the foundation revenue is changing a little bit and growing, where the foundation dollars stay the same early on. But in recent years, they've had not only unrestricted, but also restricted dollars come in, in that wind up being released from restrictions in that year. And so we could see the way that they've changed the dollars that are coming in to include both unrestricted foundation in orange, as well as likely coming from foundations, these restricted dollars that get used in those years. We also see the individual dollars coming in seem to be about the same. And our special events are also about the same. And so we can tell that it's likely that these expenses are growing as a result of new programs that they're, they're able to do as a result of this earned revenue and these foundation dollars as well. So we'd encourage you to, again, think through these historically, what has happened? How have you made investments through your expenses in being able to bring in different types of revenue and do different types of programs? And then again, check the overall bottom line to hopefully be able to see surpluses in most years, knowing that particularly as organizations grow, sometimes they might see a deficit. And use that overall trend, use that overall history to be able to think about our future um, and to understand what's likely to happen in the future. So we're coming up on the end of this webinar. And so I wanna have one last moment of reflection um, to think about anything that you learned through this webinar with our head, um, to think about if there's anything we felt as we're coming to this topic in our heart, um, or any actions that we want to take for our organization, our feet. As, as I mentioned from the beginning, this is part of a multi-part webinar series, and there's a lot of other different sections of the series. And so I'd encourage you to, to watch those that you think will be helpful. And here's, here's a list of some of the other parts of the series. And I'll make a particular note to financial planning part two, the second sort of half of this topic, where Christine is going to talk about our capital structure, our balance sheet, the other half of the circle of how we work towards financial health. So again, I'd really encourage at least to watch the second part, but to know that there, there are a number of different webinars out there. So I thank you very much, um, and we look forward to being able to engage with you somehow in the future.